It's a big week for ancient ancestor news. Uh, this is the first time we've seen a skull of this very mysterious species of ancient human that we call the Denisovans. We've never had a skull before, only a finger uh, and a bit of jawbone. So it's huge. This is huge. Yeah, this is so exciting. Mm. I didn't realise this was about to, to drop. Mm. We've um, we've known about the Denisovans since uh, about 2010 uh, when they were first discovered, but they were discovered from DNA extracted from a bit of a finger bone from the Siberian cave, the, yeah. the Denisova cave. Right. That's how they got their name. And because the DNA didn't match either us or Neanderthals, we knew that there was this other sort of recent human. Yeah, which was sent Sensational in itself, yeah. wasn't it? Because and we've been writing about it ever since. Yeah. And every time I've edited a story or read it, <laughs> had to show you have to remember that it's bone. just this one finger yeah. bone and we don't have a skull of the yeah. thing. Yeah. And it wasn't that long ago that we thought there was just us modern humans going in this line of direct ancestors back to the common ancestor with chimps. Uh, but now we know that until really quite recently, there were many species of humans or several species of humans all coexisting and interbreeding. Yes, and we'll get to that. Uh, but let's first hear about this skull. And joining us to talk about it is journalist Mike Marshall. He's the author of our smash hit Our Human Story newsletter. Mike, uh, I think you've been writing about Denise Van since uh, for us since 2010, right? Since the discovery of that finger bone. Pretty much, yes. Yes, I've been following this uh, pretty much ever since the, the original discovery. And, and so uh, what's the story then with this specific skull that we now at last know is a Denisovan? So this is a skull uh, that was found in Harbin City, which is in the very far northeast of China, uh, and it's nicknamed the Dragon Man. We've only known about this skull for a few years, but what, um, what has now happened is that researchers have been able to confirm that this skull... Uh, is definite is almost certainly a Denisovan because they've been able to obtain molecular data from it, and this skull, you know, in some respects it looks a bit like us. Yeah, you know, the, the the brain size is about is roughly on a par with a with a modern human, but it had big protruding brow ridges above its eyes, which is something that you know doesn't you know, we you don't tend to see in our species in which we associate with um, older or more archaic uh, human species. And as well as the mystery around the species, there's a real mystery about the skull, isn't there, Mike? Um, because Dragon Man, that species, they called it Homo longi initially, um, was first described in 2021. Um, but the skull had been kept secret for decades. And tell us about that story. That's right. Yeah. So it was first uncovered at some point in the 1930s. And at this time, um, Japanese occupying forces were in that area of China. It was found by uh, an unknown Chinese man. We don't know this person's name. And he recognized that it had some sort of significance and hid it down a well and and never told anyone about it until his on and until he was on his deathbed no. i think in 2018 at which point he told a few of his relatives and they got in touch with some researchers and you know and the the, the discovery unfolded from there yeah. so yeah it was uh, it was kept secret uh, mostly down the bottom of a well for the better part of a century Wow, I'd watch that movie. <laughs> Me too. Um, so now we have new evidence that tells us that this dragon man uh, was a Denisovan. How do we know that? Okay, so there's two um, strands of evidence, which is that researchers uh, in China managed to obtain DNA and proteins from the um, from the skull. They had a very hard time doing this. When I spoke to Xiao Mei Fu, the lead author the impression that she gave was that this was like getting blood out of a stone. So they tried to get DNA out of a bit, a, bo a part of the bone, which is normally really good for this. They got nothing. They did manage to get some proteins out and they, there were three amino acid variants in there that were like, associated with Denise. And so that was quite suggestive, but in order to be really confident, they also went ahead and an analyzed the dental calculus, which is this hard substance that forms on the surface of your teeth. If you don't brush off the plaque, <laughs> And they ma they managed to get some mitochondrial DNA out of that. that. That's the kind of DNA that's only inherited from your mother. So it it's not like the the full genome of the of the individual, but it's enough to be able to say with confidence, yes, uh, this is a Denisovan. And they were big lads, weren't they, Mike? How do we know that? <laughs> yes. So I mean, this has been suspected ever since the you know the first few Denisovan discoveries, because as well as that finger bone, the sliver of mm. finger bone that was found in the cave, they also found a few molar teeth, and those were big. Mm. 
And then the next uh, sort of fossil that was really confidently identified as a Denisovan was a was a lower jawbone, a mandible that was found in a cave on the Tibetan plateau, and that's big. And Harbin, the Harbin skull, the dragon man skull, is big. It's bulky. So yeah, it all this sort of evidence has come together to suggest that they were sort of quite quite stocky, quite sort of big in bulk. Um, one of the researchers I spoke to suggested that as a lean ma body mass of 100 kilos, which is kind of like American football player um, levels of bulk. So let's get on to the interbreeding story. Um, we know that there was definitely that this did, did happen because uh, in populations in Southeast Asia and Melanesia, uh, that some people have up to five percent of Denisovan DNA. Um, so you know they were all over the place. It seems back in the day. But what I can't really get my head around, Mike, is was it are they a separate species? You know, we call we have Homo sapiens, we have Homo neanderthalensis. And we just say, oh, the Denisovans for the, the poor old Denisovans. What, what's going on? So it base it comes down to the fact that um, we have never had enough information about the Denisovans to be able to describe them properly. So their DNA, when it, as soon as it was sort of discovered back in 2010, their DNA is as different from Neanderthals as Neanderthal DNA is from us. And so right. if you just on that, just on that basis, they're sort of different enough to count as a new species. But you, that's not enough according to the sort of the official rules of scientific taxonomy you can't just sort of say oh well you know that's a new species you actually have to be able to describe in detail what the species looked like what it you know what its skeleton was like for example and we've just never had that so w with the skull now maybe we can i think we i think we're getting closer to it i mean it's still um it's still a slightly limited sample you know i mean it's 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 one skull mm. plus plus some jaw bones and some other bits um and so what that isn't quite enough to tell you is how much the, is how variable they are. So it, you, you could you could find another skull in in China or thereabouts tomorrow and sort of go, well, it looks about right. Is it right enough to yeah. be sort of confident about it? And, and what we don't have is you know things like um, arm bones or the pelvis. What about in collections all over the world? There must be loads of people who, who've maybe inadvertently got got bits of bones that turn out to be Denisovans. Oh, almost, almost certainly. Yeah, you know, some of the bones that have been identified as, as Denisovan have been had been around for a while anyway. And there's, you know, there's, for example, there's a set of bones from a site called Zhujiao in China, which have been they were excavated in the 70s. And everybody who looks at them says, "Well, these are just an absolute cast iron match for the Denisovan fossils that we've got." Yeah, the teeth look at really, really similar, okay. but no one has managed to get molecular data out of them yet, so we don't have the sort of the confirmation, but. Every, everyone is like 80 90 percent confident that they're going to turn out to be Denisovan in the end and about the about their size Mike what do we are there any ideas about why they were so big because there are ideas about Neanderthals what what might have made them big but it is a bit of a mystery because in the case of the Neanderthals what people have tended to think is well it's to do with cold climates because Neanderthals lived in um, sort of Western Europe and sort of parts of Western Asia often during uh, glacial periods when temperatures were colder than they are now. And so, yeah, having a big sort of like bulky body sort of is a good way of helping you to survive in the cold climate because it reduces heat loss. That doesn't immediately make sense for the Denisovans, though, because although we we first found them in a cave in Siberia, which is pretty cold, and they've been found on the Tibetan Plateau, there's also um, Denisovan remains from, you know, apparently various parts of China, uh, one possible one from Laos, one from Taiwan. These are not cold places. So it's not entirely obvious what would be going on there. One possibility is that um, there may have actually been a number of different types of Denisovan. So from the original cave, there have been a number of little fragments of bone and teeth and whatever collected, and people have managed to get DNA from those. And what that shows us is two different populations at different times. So there's an older population from like over 100,000 years ago. And there's a, a more recent population from sort of 80 to 50,000 years ago, thereabouts. And they're quite genetically distinct. Hmm. The Harbin skull, which, you know, which is big and bulky, is, belongs to that older population. But we don't really have um, identified fossils from the younger population. They may have looked different. And it may be that those, the ones that lived you know, in the warmer tropical places may have actually ha evolved to have um, slightly more sort of slender, what's called gracile bodies, but we just don't know yet. And, and you know, people speculate about why the Neanderthals went extinct. Is it too early to start 
with that on the Denisovans? Or did we just sort of absorb them into our, you know, meta genome? I think it's, yeah, it is way too early to be co- to say anything definitive because the thing with Neanderthals is that we have loads of remains of them from lots of different places. And even from sites where we don't have skeletons, they, ha- they made distinctive stone tools that can be recognized. So you can have a really good sense of where and when they were living. You can see their population kind of shrink down into what's now essentially Spain as, the, as, they, as they, they sort of came towards their end. We don't have that same sort of record of what happened to the Denisovans, whereas we, ha- we have like little, tiny little fragments of the picture. I mean, the one thing that does sort of immediately leap to mind is that, yeah, as you were hinting, they did seem to survive until around about the sort of time that modern humans arrived in the area and sort of really established themselves in the area. So it may be that there's some interaction going on there, but whether that's that you know they were outcompeted by us or, as you suggested, that they just kind of disappeared into our population through interbreeding, mm. uh, yeah, we, we at this point we don't know, but it's going to be fascinating to, if someone can actually find you know, some Denisovan remains from Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea where the genetic signal of them is really strong and get a sense of what happened at the very end. I mean, this golden era of human archaeology just keeps going, doesn't it? And yeah. we're, we're, as they're getting better extracting stuff out of these ancient fossils, yeah. we're going to be able to find out maybe other species that coexisted back in the day. So yeah, the rate of discovery of new um, human species has really picked up over the, the last 20 years, whether that's in Africa or in Asia, and, and especially in Southeast Asia, where we have like the hobbits on Flores and Homo luzonensis on Luzon. On Luzon. Mm. And some of that's just to do with exploration, but it is also to do with, yeah, this, you know, the use of molecular evidence like the DNA and especially the proteins, which although that you can't tell quite as much from, a, you know, from, ha- from having a few proteins as you can from having a full genome, it is, it can be enough to be able to say, oh, this is genuinely a distinct mm. population and to, and to sort of start drawing family trees and so forth. One of the things that I'm really keen to see happen is for someone to f- finally get some molecular evidence out of a, a Homo erectus fossil, which we don't have yet. Wow. They were the first. Hu- they were the first humans to leave Africa to go out into Asia and went all the way to Java, and they survived for you know, well over a million years. We don't have molecular evidence from them, so we don't know if they're related to the Neanderthals or how they're related to the Denisovans. Uh, crack on with that! Come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> know, what are these people doing? <laughs> how hard can it be? <laughs> I have to say, when I was learning about ancient DNA, which I, I like to think isn't that long ago, when I was at uni, you know, the message was we can't really tell anything. The technology is not really worth anything. And, and in what, what's it been, 10, 20 years? It's phenomenal what we can now tell. And my favorite fact, I think, that we've learned about the Denisovans in the time that we've known about them, what's that, 15 years, is that Tibetans have a, a stretch of DNA from the Denisovans that helps yep. them tolerate low oxygen on the high altitudes of the Tibetan plain. So like often when we talk about interbreeding, 5% Denisovan, 2% Neanderthal, it sounds really academic, but people are alive today using genes from these interbreeding events. Mm, it's amazing. Um, well, when I was at university, they'd only just discovered the structure of DNA. No, so. no that was nonsense. <laughs> <laughs>